as this crisis unfolds, we've really started looking at different ways we can start and try to make sense of it. We've looked at complexity, and now in this film we're looking at mythopoetics. And this is a subject really close to my heart because I'm a writer and I've always been fascinated by myth and the idea that myth can teach us something about being human and how to be in the world that we can't really get from anywhere else. So I'm fascinated uh, by looking at myth as almost like a kind of hidden code in the stories we tell. This is one of the really interesting things about looking at things through a mythic lens is that stories and structures of stories repeat over and over again. And right now, when we're in a crisis like this and everything is uncertain, myth is really coming into its own as a way to start to make sense. So I spoke to three people whose work I really admire in this area, and they were Zach Stein, who is uh, a psychologist and also an education reformer. And he wrote this uh, brilliant piece recently called A War in Heaven. We're on a very intense journey, you know, worth a couple lifetimes. Like, it's very intense. But I think at this point, it's, it's less like we've got a map and we know where we're going, and more like, again, to use another image of, from biblical myth, it's like wandering in the wilderness together. This is where we are. I wanted to speak to someone who is an expert on, on death and dying and our cultural attitudes towards that, and I couldn't think of anyone better than Stephen Jenkinson, who is, uh, used to be a palliative care counselor and worked in a, a large hospital in North America, and... Um, was with thousands and thousands of people as, as they died. So Stephen Jenkinson has written a lot about how a person can die well. And I was curious to ask him about how does a culture die well? Again, I learned this thing at the death street. So you really love somebody who's dying, yes. Do you think they're dying? Do they refuse to be dying? Or are they dying? Because the answer to that question determines what you do next. So let's say they're dying. They don't agree that they are, but they are. They're in the early stages of it. What is the etiquette of your relationship with them? How do you conduct yourself as if what's happening is happening? That becomes the question for a dying person in your household, and it becomes the same question for a time like now where we get to glimpse how utterly exhausted our acquisitive way of doing things has become. So I also spoke to Charlotte DeCan, and Charlotte is a writer and a storyteller, and she's one of the editors of The Dark Mountain Project, which is a publication that, like Rebel Wisdom, explores um, systemic fragility and explores the kind of mythopoetic substructure of, of culture as well. You know, you can live up here with it as a story, and it isn't li lived. But I, th I think we are being absolute, I don't think that's how they were written. And I don't think that's what we need to do with them. I think we need to embody them. So this is something we've been looking at since the beginning of the channel, like what are the deep stories of culture trying to tell us from Jordan Peterson, looking at kind of the deep source code of the Bible and pre-biblical knowledge uh, to, I think the, the best that I heard was Jordan Hall summarized it in one of our interviews where he talked about the mythopoetic layer being the place where we put knowledge that we might only need once a generation or once a millennium. This is the thing that Jordan Peterson is, I think, most clearly trying to articulate in that space. You know, our archetypes, our mythologies, the ones that cover a lot of cultures and last a long time, do so because they are the, the things that have been most deeply associated with what has fucking worked. You know, those cultures that do certain things in certain ways endure, and we perceive them as stories, so we can, we can listen to them, but it's not the stories that matter, it's the embodied practices. If you're not living it, you're not doing the religious aspect. Where would you store that information? Well, you'd store it in the deep, in the deep mythopoetic layer, in the stories that underpin the culture. So this really feels like a time where we should be going into that uh, deeper mythopoetic layer and pulling out what, what has been stored there by our ancestors for the times that we're going through now. There are also a few themes that really came out as I was talking to people. And so the first one is this idea of the liminal. The liminal uh, means that space between. And Zach Stein, uh, he calls it that, that space between worlds, which I think is a really nice way to talk about it. And the liminal is a weird place in myth because we step past some kind of threshold. And it's interesting that word threshold actually comes from the from doorway. That's the doorway. And we have actually done that as a species. We've stepped through our doorways into a place that's very familiar to us, our homes, but in this insanely unfamiliar situation. 
So you step past the threshold and then you're in this world that is sort of between things. You know, in, in Stranger Things, it's the upside down, right? It's kind of like our world, but it's all inverted. The rules that used to apply didn't apply. And Zach Stein really spoke of this really beautifully. So it's going to play a clip of where he goes into it in a bit more detail. What's your, what's your sense on what that space means psychologically or mythically? Like, what, what does it really mean to be right now in a space between worlds? Right. <clears throat> uh, I mean, it's, it's disorienting. That's the first thing. It's disorienting and scary. <laughs> and this is like when you, when, remember I said, like, once you reach a certain age, it becomes hard to die to yourself and create it yourself. One of the main reasons for that is because of the disorientation and fear that sets in when one world is no longer the world and another world hasn't set in. And, you know, so the experience is one of being un unmoored and seeking for some deeper root than the superficial things that were grounding you. Um, and so it is both a feeling of disorientation and a feeling of grasping or wanting or imagining, right? And, and so that's the place where the kind of metaphor of the war of heaven comes in because it's in that opening of imagination where there's this battle between the different kind of voices and archetypes that populate the human psyche. Um, but when the world's just running, heaven stays put, right? And there's the fantasies and we watch them on TV about what's going to happen. Like, but when the world starts to shift and change radically, then you, heaven and earth kind of collide. And in your own imagination, you start to see possibilities in the actual world that look hellish or heaven-like, right? And this is what we're seeing is that everyone's imagination is going to the possibility of worst case, right? These terrible things that you wish thought you'd only ever see on a movie now all of a sudden are like flooding into your actual experience. Um, things that were mythic in the sense of being like a myth that you watch on the screen are now like playing out in front of you, right? So there's this, the heaven and earth collide. Um, and similarly, other people are seeing this possibility for a radical positivity to come out of this on the other end, right? That now is the moment in response to tragedy and pain when utopia could be forged, right? And so again, like heaven, this fantasy <laughs> of a completely different economic system, like this fantasy where you could stop the capitalist world system with a button and everyone thing grinds to a halt. Wait a second, that just happened, right? So it's like heaven and earth collide again. And there's this incredible imaginal potency, which makes the choice, the feeling of choice dizzying. Because it's like, you know, are you going to turn into a bad guy? Or are you going to turn into a hero? Right? Usually, you don't even have to ask that question because you're just a you're just a guy. <laughs> but now, depending what happens with the way this plays out, you may have to choose between being a villain and being a hero. Right? Acting out of complete selfishness to protect yourself, or giving of yourself to help others. Right? That you'll there will be the opportunity to make real choices that affect character. Um, and, uh, and so that's the other thing that happens between worlds is that uh, and there's a line in the paper. I say, you know, precious are the moments of world making. And this is the case in your own life when you know you're in between and you're at those critical choice points, right? When relationships end, when jobs end, when people die, when health crises hits, you know that in those moments, the choices you make are more, pronounced because you're at the beginning of a new fork in the road. Um, so yeah. So the time between worlds also feels um, uh, ethically charged. feels like the moments are more important. What do you do with your time matters more. Uh, and so I was speaking to Verveke yesterday and we were just, or it was the day before and we were going on this notion of Kairos, right? That it's this potency time, this pregnant time. The time between worlds, which again is not a good. It's not like happy time. It's not like yay, you know. It's not at all like that. It's actually quite scary and terrifying. Um, but uh, also, again, part of that 
part of human experience. So we are experiencing something now, although it's novel. Humans experience this. Like this is what humans have since we've been humans experienced the sense of the whole system. We're all in it together, and the whole system, something's happening, right? Like again, the flood myth, like that's what that story is about. It's like, oh my God, a flood is coming. Like we used to be not friends and like battling and like there's all this stuff happening before this, but now this is happening. And just overwhelming collective kind of opening of the psyche towards fear, towards love, right? But way more energy and kind of like dynamics in the mind and in the culture. Uh, so yeah, that that's what it feels like a little bit to be in a time between worlds. For those who would see this this crisis um, as terrible as it is, as simultaneously a call to adventure, where do you think that adventure might be towards? Maybe every individual's will be different, but do you think, without obviously asking you to kind of map out the future, what, is there some kind of attractor that you feel we might be moving towards as we as we move forward? Interesting. Uh... Yeah, adventure is not the word. I don't think adventure is the word that I use, and I wouldn't use the word adventure. It's uh, it's not an adventure. It's more like a potentially ecstatic ordeal, right? That it's a potentially beautiful tragedy or redemptive tragedy. Um, but, you know, uh, there's a crucifixion before the resurrection, and it hurts. Hell. So the the kind of journey that we're on is the journey that we've sketched out a little bit here, right? It's this journey into death. It's a journey into depth um, and into intimacy and relationship, not necessarily physical close proximity, although you will be perhaps locked in a house with people for a while, but a deepening of intimacy because you know, every phone call you have could go there. You know what I mean? It's like, it's going to be hard to keep pretense of normalcy. And that means that we're all open to the depths of one another. So we're on an adventure into, yeah, it's like a, for a fear of sounding cheesy, uh, like a soul adventure. It's an, it's a, it's a, an, it's a journey of deepening in of individual and species. And you know, when you think of that notion of ensoulment, it's a term I use technically, and that's another conversation, but tragedy is the structure of ensoulment, pain, right? Depth and the grappling and the entwinement with others rather than separation with others. Um, so yeah, in that sense, the immediacy of it's a, it's a site. It, we're on a, we're on a very intense journey, you know, worth a couple lifetimes. Like it's very intense. Um, and then there will be changes physically, like to commodity supply chains, to economics. And so there, there will be a, a social economic journey, basically. But I think at this point, it's, it's less like we've got a map and we know where we're going. And more like, again, to use another image of, from biblical myth, it's like wandering in the wilderness together. This is where we are. And so when you're in the wilderness, <clears throat> you have to bring your temple with you, right? And it becomes not a temple in space, but a temple in time. And it allows you, even though you don't know exactly where you're going, to be together, um, right? In that shared container of meaning. Uh, and so in that sense, yeah, we're, we're on that pilgrimage or wandering through the wilderness. Um, and so what I'm arguing, not arguing, I'm basically pleading for <laughs> is that we remember to create these temples in time where we can be together, um, in reality, no matter how bad it gets, um, and know that it, this is what humans have always done. And in a sense, it's kind of like what we're made for <laughs> is to experience the in, intense and tragic beauty of life together, um, and yeah, so that's a little bit of that. So yeah, not an action adventure movie, not at all. So another theme that really emerged talking to everybody was this theme of death and rebirth. So that as we go through a transition, 
something necessarily has to die. You know, a lot of people are talking about that the system that we've been in has to die for something else to come out of it. My sense is, after 65 harrowing years on the planet, that people rarely do their best. Sorry to say it out loud, but there it is. If this is our best, you know, what we've done to the thing entrusted to us, God Almighty, either we're not doing our best or God help us, this is our best. I'm going with, I think, the more humanly benevolent vision that we're not doing our best. That's the first thing. And so we can't fall back on the idea that left to our own devices, we'll get it straight. We are being left to our own devices. And we're not getting it straight, you see? So we're going to have to be defeated. My vision, vision excuse me, is the sooner we're defeated, the better for all concerned. Mm -hmm. Do I know what that looks like? Do, do, am I not aware that there's all kinds of wreckage of various kinds that, are, that will ensue from what I'm saying? Yeah, man, I don't have the blueprint, right? But if you're asking me as a citizen, of a troubled time, then my responsibility as a citizen is to glimpse the end or the extinction of this particular kind of citizenship. Mm -hmm. You know, our regime has no business being in the world. This is a demonstrable fact. It's not an opinion. It's a fact. And even though the likes of, and I, I really adore Jordan Peterson, but when he continued in the old days, mm -hmm. seems so long ago now, mm -hmm. to favor the, the, the developments of the West and so on, I, I think I understand why he would do so, but he has to ignore certain other things at his peril in order to make that case, sadly. So, again, I learned this thing at the death trade. So you really love somebody who's dying, yes. Do you think they're dying? Do they refuse to be dying? Or are they dying? Because the answer to that question determines what you do next. So let's say they're dying. They don't agree that they are, but they are. They're in the early stages of it. What is the etiquette of your relationship with them? How do you conduct yourself as if what's happening is happening? That becomes the question for a dying person in your household, and it becomes the same question for a time like now where we get to glimpse how utterly exhausted our acquisitive way of doing things has become. So what do you do? And the answer to my mind is you bear faithful witness to the, the realities of the dying. And you, you orchestrate yourself in the presence of the dying, not to spite it, not to overcome it, and not to pretend it's not there for the sake of mutual comfort, but to risk it all, to risk the relationship, the friendship, whatever it is, and, and failure and fail to conspire with the idea that there's more time. There isn't more time. And that confers this to, upon this time a real sense of urgency. And if I really love you, I'm going to be, be with you as if you won't be around much longer. Right? And it, how that makes you feel in the short term, well, it's going to be wild and, and, and strange and we don't know how to do it. We don't have an etiquette for endings in a culture that doesn't believe in them. So it's one of the reasons I guess I, I ended up doing that book is to try to advocate for a sense of, you could say, fundamental etiquette, uh, existential etiquette, an etiquette of kind of radical love about what it means to see something down. That's the phrase I came to use to describe it. And that's what we have to do now. We have to be willing to see our regime down. Of course, do I, it means living with a lot less, including a lot less certainty and no sense of safety. I mean, my country embarrasses me as they, as they whine and mule at the government for the, you know, the, the sustaining handout instead. Da, 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 da. Look, man, this situation was completely anticipatable. It's unprecedented, but it's completely anticipatable. Okay. Now you've had a taste. How many more tastes you want? Don't make a meal of this. Push away from the table now. And something else that usually comes out through, through very old myths is that they teach us something about our role as human beings in the world. 
And Stephen Jenkinson has talked about this a lot as well. And I asked him about elders specifically, because he's written a book about that. What's the role of elders right now? And he also then talked about what is the role of artists? So to my mind, it goes like this. You know, elders are not people. Elders are not personality types, not an age group. An elder is by definition a verb. That means it has a sequence, a kind of cascading sequence of responsibilities that accrue to individual people and then pass them by. Not always the same people all the time. You know, comes and goes according to their skillfulness and their willingness to submit to life and so on like that. Yeah, all of that's true. But at the end of the day, you could say the, the fundamental elder function is the same function as the function of the artist. Like this. The artist's responsibility is to take their skillfulness, develop it, of course, learn like crazy. And ultimately, the product of their work should function prismatically. Not complementary complementarily, but prismatically, by which I mean that the culture, which is invisible to itself, the daily comings and goings of a culture, basically like the fish's water, right? We don't see it. Something goes sideways, we see it for a little while, and then we go back to not seeing as quickly as we can. But what the art does is it takes the essentially invisible culture, the culture passes through the art, and the constituent parts of the culture are refracted out the other side. That's the encounter with the art, the unbidden, unsuspected um, consequence of arousal or discombobulation or, you know, whatever it is. And so the, the principal responsibility of the artist is to get out of the way of the art so the culture can pass through, be refracted on the other side with this caveat that the artist has absolutely no obligation to restore, to reassure, to soothe the culture as a consequence of what the artwork does. Okay, they have to stand by the consequence of the work. And if they're doing it very well indeed, you, well, you can think of examples of people who've done that very thing. And unfortunately, sometimes the culture will turn turn them into politicians or spokespeople for their generations. And, so, and they should resist all seduction to do such a thing because that means um, they're supposed to be complementary of that particular generation they stand for and so forth. So elders function in a similar way, I think. Uh, elders' responsibility is to bear faithful witness to the current circumstances, the current regime, whatever the consequence of truth-telling might be, whatever calamity ensues, First things first. The first thing is what's happening. And, and the, the benefit of their years should be that they're able to find a, a ever more faithful language that bears forward what's happening. So that you don't have to look past them because they're no longer teaching. They're becoming practitioners of what they're advocating. So you just look to them. And alas, we live in a time now where so many older people are discredited for very understandable and even legitimate reasons. That it's, and it's a deep, challenging thing indeed to try to decide what constitutes the function of elderhood in a calamitous time like ours. Is it really that guy with his billions getting ready to send you to Mars if you've got enough money? Is that who you want to follow? So that was what really attracted me to Jordan Peterson's work originally, was this sense of recapturing the mythopoetic, and especially Jung, because Jung was the psychologist in the sort of early uh, 20th century, mid 20th century, who went more deeply into the unconscious than just about anyone else and started pulling out the ideas of archetypes. And, so, and I think there was an amazing quote by Jordan Peterson where he said, Jung brought together the world of, of sort of myth and story with science and psychology and this was absolutely one of the most crucial pieces of work that was actually done in the 20th century we embody a lot of information in our action right? and our action has developed as a consequence of imitating other people and not only the people the people around us but of course the people around us imitated the people who came before them and those people imitated the people who came before them and so on so far back that 
it's as far back as you can go. And so you embody these patterns of behavior that are extremely informative that you don't understand that are a consequence of collective imitation across the centuries. And so then those patterns can become manifest as figures of the imagination. And those figures of imagination are the distillations of patterns of behavior. And so as the distillations of patterns of behavior, they have content. And it's not you that content. It's, you could even think about it as content that's evolved, although it's culturally transmitted. It's content that's evolved. And so these figures of the imagination can reveal the structure of reality to you. And that's what happened with Jung. And that's what he described in the Red Book. And that was what permeated his psychology, a psychology that was based on the presupposition that the fundamental archetypal structures of religious belief were not pathological, not deceitful, not protective in some delusional sense against the fear of death, but quite the contrary. The very stories that enabled us to move forward as confident human beings in the face of chaos itself. And it's conceivable, I think perhaps probable, that nothing more important conceptually happened in the 20th century than that. Because it was the first time post-enlightenment that a rapprochement between the intellect and the underlying religious archetypal substructure occurred. You have in the capacious intellect of Jung, and the same thing happened to some degree with Piaget, the religious domain and the factual domain were brought back together. And the fact of Jung's enduring and increasing popularity and influence, I would say, is a direct consequence of that. Jordan Peterson is now looked at as a kind of, um, by some people, as a quite reactionary figure and a quite a traditionalist. But actually, that's incredibly radical. That kind of the Jungian frame is an incredibly radical frame to be bringing into academia and bringing into even into kind of modern culture. When he first kind of arose, it's like, wow, he's taking Jung seriously. He was told by his colleagues at, at, at the various institutions he was teaching at not to go near Jung, that that would be career suicide, don't go near it, and he kind of went into it anyway. And that, I think, is a really, that's what I think made him such a kind of archetypal figure himself, Jordan Peterson, because he was bringing in this kind of archetypal force of the, the story of the culture. Um, where that gets integrated and where it's not integrated is another question. I think it's a deeper question that I'd love to unpack in the future. Uh, thinking about potentially doing a film about the legacy of, of Jordan Peterson's thought and that sort of amazing trajectory that we saw over the, those kind of couple of years. Um, but that, for me, is really interesting. Yeah, I think really important when we're talking about myth and story as a way to make sense of the world and a way to make sense of our experience is to really uh, draw on Jung and the just the very idea that we have an unconscious as individuals so that we are not aware of everything that's going on with us. In fact, we're not aware of most of what's going on with us a lot of the time. And in that unconscious part of ourselves, there are, uh, you know, in Jung's theory, and this is really simplifying it, but let's say like encoded ways of being that are very, very old and that are, you know, maybe drawn by experiences our ancestors had many, many, many times. So, you know, the wise old woman or the wise old man and the trickster and all these different types of ways of being that we all can embody at some point and can have access to. So there's that on the individual level, but it also spreads out to what Jung called the collective unconscious. And that's where this becomes especially useful to look at. You know, what is coming out of the collective unconscious when we go through a major, major shift and a major crisis like we're seeing right now? And how do we, how do we go in there and try and make sense of it? And a key thing to mention, I think, is that part of the reason Jung is so difficult to bring into academia is that Jung was really sanitized by, by Jungians after he died. Um, Peter Kingsley's written a great book called Catafalque all about this and about Jung the mystic and, and how people have misinterpreted him. And this idea of understanding the world in this very, let's say, it's not the, the way of knowing of science because it's really about symbolism and, and nuance and aesthetic and feeling. And, and you know, it's so different to, to being able to sit down and measure something. But at the same time, we are able to at least map out, in a sense, what myths can tell us. And probably the person who did that 
best, or one of the people who did it best, was Joseph Campbell, who um, has a theory called the monomyth, which is the idea that all of our mythic structures that we tell, all the stories we tell, whether you're in an Inuit tribe 500 years ago or you're in um, you know, at London in 2020, we tell the, sim- the same structures over and over because they are so deeply encoded in us. And it's really the story of our process of discovery and change over time. Which is also called the hero's journey. The hero's journey. And in fact, Charlotte Ducan, who I spoke to, you know, she raised a really interesting point about you know, is, you know, the hero's journey has been recently criticized as being very male focused. And I've always been very curious about this because I see that trajectory play out in stories about women as well. So I, I kind of have issue with that. Um, Charlotte Ducan mentioned this very interesting thing that male initiation and female initiation, um, are actually play out differently, but they actually still follow that trajectory of we go from a place of somehow being deluded or somehow being safe in our little area or, you know, we're in the Shire or we're on Tatooine, if you're Luke Skywalker, and then we step out into the world, into a different type of world where we grow as a human being. So it might be that it's a call to adventure or as Charlotte says in a lot of female initiation stories, you start at the top and then you're right down and she calls it in the ashes. All your, everything is stripped away, which is the process we're going through. This stripping away of all our pretenses, the stripping away of the nice dress you were wearing And then you're sitting in the muck with a fire. But that process of coming back into the earth is really regenerative. Um, So there's such a a richness to this whole area. And Charlotte has a really interesting take on uh, one myth in particular, which is the myth of Psyche. And I asked her a little bit about why that myth is so important right now and what it can tell us. And and the thing about the myth of Psyche is that I think I say, uh, I talk about this in the piece that, you know, Her name means butterfly. And there's this image of, you know, we are like a caterpillar culture that's devouring everything. Every green thing has been devoured. And at some point we have to go into the cocoon and transform. And in many ways, the self-isolation is a kind of cocooning in order that we go and become a different kind of human being. I mean, whether we'll all respond like that is a different matter. It remains to be seen. (laughs) But I feel it's a really, it's a very good metaphor. Uh, and the feeling that one, everything's dissolving and crashing down is, is part of what happens in a cocoon when a caterpillar becomes an amalgam. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice image, very potent one. Um, you mentioned just now about uh, us all having, or us all going through our own transformation in a unique way, we're all different. Um, in, outbreak in the, the piece we were just talking about, I think you mentioned somewhere that the female and the male initiatory journey and myth is actually different. And that's an idea I'm really curious about. Uh, to, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. In, in what ways, and of course, we probably know much more about the male one because of the hero's journey and Joseph Campbell, etc., which is mm-hmm. where I know a lot of my uh, myth knowledge from. And so I've, I'm really very curious about these these different types of initiation and and how they might apply to to right now? Well, I think, I think, I mean, it it is a broad generalization to say all male myths are about going out and doing the hero's journey, Um, because I don't think they all are. And some of them contain moments of eating ashes and and being confused and having to go down. But really, in all the female myths that I've read in fairy stories, there is the classic form is that you lose your shiny. You know, it's like Cinderella upside down. You start at the palace and then you end up in this, in, you know, sitting by the fire, by the ashes with the mouse and with the the little creatures in, in, in the kitchen. Um, And this is called, uh, this is what I call kitchen work. They all start there. So, you know, if you go into the forest and encounter Baba Yuga in the, in, in the classic, Russian fairy tales, she is a hard taskmistress. She's like Venus. They are tough because they know you have to be tough and resourceful to live properly on the planet. They're not, they're not mean. What they're teaching you is that you can't be a princess. But we live in a princess culture. I mean, well, a lot of girls do anyway, I would say. You know, and that is just, it's not about, you can't be a princess on the planet. You could be beautiful, but you can't be a princess. And so this is what all the female myths say, you need to go down, you know, stop shopping at Primark. It's not what it's about. 
It's interesting that you mentioned the collective unconscious because I think we've all had this sense of feeling that sort of sense of the collective consciousness much more than ever before. This sort of sense that everyone is focused on the same thing, knowing that everyone is aware of the same thing, everyone is focused on the same thing. And that's sort of this sense of initiation as well, that the hero's journey, uh, the monomyth is all about initiation. It's all about going from one state to another and why it's so relevant is that it maps onto, it's the process that we all individually go through and then it's represented in myth, it's represented in story. And so that's a really interesting frame to bring to it as well, this sort of sense of could this crisis be a collective initiation in some way? Um, uh, I think it has to be. I think it's kind of like, this is the sense that I think a lot of people have had. It's like, we can't waste this crisis. And if we do waste this crisis, then we're going to just store up for another crisis that's almost likely to be bigger than this one. So another aspect of being in the liminal or the space between worlds, as that calls it, is that it's really a, a trial. It's an initiation. And, and it's, um, as Charlotte Ducan actually said, it's really easy in myth to go into the underworld. It's really difficult to get out of the underworld. And that's what really distinguishes um, a character and a story. And so Zach spoke, uh, spoke really well about um, what, what it actually takes and what, what this process is of being in this liminal space. Life, life itself, of no, not of your own doing, will often create situations that demand a profound change in your identity, right? And uh, again, the loss of a loved one, a spouse or a brother or sister or something that will make you have to change. And so there's a dynamic to the psyche where this is part of living that we become new people. And so my background is, was in developmental psychology um, and philosophy of education. And the whole thing there, a la, you know, Keegan and, and others and Dawson and uh, Kurt Fisher is that actually we can, we can look at how this actually works. There are ways that we are, we are by just growing up <laughs> over time, become new people so that the mind can do this. But for many adults beyond the age of, let's say 30 or so, for various reasons, it becomes harder and harder to, to, uh, to die to yourself basically, and to, to create a more responsive and adaptive way of being, it becomes harder to do that. Um, and we can go into that, but that's not kind of the point here. Uh, so in this moment, the whole world is basically put into a situation where, again, every unique person contemplating their own unique situation and unique death brings us to a situation where kind of mass metanoia, right? Which is to say mass transformation of psyche will occur. Um, and then there's a question of, will it happen to us or will we try to gain sovereignty and agency over the transformation of self that's being asked for. Um, and this is the main thing you can do as a support person for someone in a process of transformation, right? Is to give them the scaffoldings they need to be able to, to choose, to not be subject to circumstance, but to be able to feel like they can be true to their most important principles, right? Not like not protect them from pain, but actually put them in a position to be able to know who they want to become and to act from those principles, which means that no matter how bad it gets, you can keep your integrity. Um, and so it's about moving the sense of self from the kind of extrinsic motivation and extrinsic reward system to a deep seat of intrinsic motivation. This is language thing came to me the other day. The, the, the word liminal yeah. comes from limen, so threshold in Latin. And threshold in English, I think the etymology is, is kind of disputed, but it's, it's the, the, right at the edge of our door. It might be where we held the thresh in or where we you know, clean our feet. And I find that fascinating. It's like we are in this very liminal space, but we're through the threshold into this incredibly familiar place, in, into our homes. I mean, do you, do you think that kind of that kind of coming home into the home is, is a place to start without reconnecting to ourselves? Well, this is going to sound very ungenerous, mm. but I'm not sure the lion's share of the selves you just referred to 
is anything that you'd really want to reconnect with. <laughs> mm. Okay. It's, I mean, it's an important thought to consider, right? Mm. I mean, if you're just going to blame the Trumps of the world for the way it is and the big pharma and the, you know, all of that, and you basically absolve yourself of any participation in it, then what you say stands mm. re connect with ourselves. But we have to recognize that as citizens of an alleged free country, we aid and abet the circumstances we lament so desperately, right? And those selves you were just referring to, they're principal players in keeping this whole operation going. And if you have any doubt of that, look at the consequence of us keeping those selves of ours to ourselves at home, the direct palpable consequence just economically, right? So the world could use less of ourselves, it seems to me. And right now it, it may be enjoying itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, as I said, that sounds ungenerous. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean this in, in a caustic or condemning fashion, mm -hmm. but it is an invitation to consider this notion of getting back or returning mm -hmm. or reorienting or reacquainting or all of that language that has RE at the front of it is to be suspected, mm -hmm. is to be wondered about. It's like, uh, I don't know if you have this where you are, but certainly for the last 30 or 40 years, people are using language like rewilding, which is absolutely hilarious, or getting back to the land. And anybody who ever used that phrase was never on the land to begin with, you see? So there's no, there's no reacquainting to do. It's learning. It's not getting familiar again, right? Mm. So that's, that's my, my plea, is to not pick up where we left off, mm -hmm. to imagine that the thing that was interrupted had no business continuing. And this, this virus, this is a God. That's not overstating things. This is a God. And the God's in the house. And the gods having God's way as God tends to do. And our obligation is to be exercise a kind of radical hospitality to this anarchic presence. Mm. And to learn how to be undone by this presence. A really common theme was that we are all of us right now together in the wilderness somewhere, you know, metaphorically. We're out past a point of no return in many ways. And Zach Stein said it really beautifully, actually, when we're in the wilderness, we have to carry our temple with us. So we have to, I think what he means by that is that the things that matter most to us and the things that will help us through and kind of help us overcome are things that we have to, to hold very dear and we have to keep hold of them as we're in this really liminal space. And very practically, for me, I think that translates to some of those qualities that we can develop by connecting with each other deeply and authentically, by increasing our resilience, by uh, following the, the truth of our experience, and all of those core qualities that so many wisdom traditions and so many people have talked about for years as being really key to cultivate, now it feels like more than ever, it's all coming to a fore. And everything that we might have been cultivating up until now, suddenly now is the time to use them. The adolescents who form their mature adult identity under these conditions are the ones who will lead the future. And so we need to be concerned about ourselves, of course, as adults, <laughs> and we need to take care of ourselves as adults, but we need to take care of ourselves as adults on behalf of this generation who is coming of age during this. Uh, so that's, and that's where the place of like the new person emerging, that's where that becomes like most vibrant. It's in that, that age group. Um, and so, yes, so that's a little bit on that. There's of course a lot to say on that, but I'm not trying to say we all need to become this kind of person who can transcend fear or we all need to become this kind of person who can like be there for others. It's like, it's, it's much more nuanced. Um, Right now, some people need to go inside to love themselves <laughs> and deal with their own shit before they could ever go and help other people, right? Um, some, right now, some people need to stop helping other people so much so that they don't break down and then become a burden on everyone else, right? So there's a lot of dynamics that are in play. The key thing I'm pointing to is, and it's one, I think it's the first question in my 
essay, you know, can we clarify the things that we're most committed to, like the core of our integrity as a person? And if we know that, can we then understand what it would mean to be that person under all circumstances, right? And then we've found a kind of compass. Um, and when it comes to what are those core commitments and what are the languages we use to describe the things we would die for, that's where we need to have discussions like these. That's where the dialogos comes in, where we talk about the deepest parts of our lives that touch everything, right? The issues of ultimate concern. And these are the conversations you fall into with people in hospice work, right? Or in caregiving work, or even in just the state of fear of the ambient kind of like, skull grinning in on the banquet, right? Um, so yeah, new people are coming. And it's this question of who, who, we will, who we will choose to become, essentially. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching, and see you soon. <laughs>